So, so, this is a continuation of the uh, last lecture uh, more or less. Um, so, you see our uh, situation is that we have taken uh, a sequence f n of uh, functions, analytic functions defined on a domain in the complex plane okay. and uh, we have assumed that f n converges to f, uh, uh, f n converges to f where f is now a function again defined on the same domain. Okay on which each of the f n is defined, but now you are al allowing f to take the value infinity. Okay. So, f is considered as a function in not into the complex plane, it is considered as a function into C union infinity the extended complex plane okay. and the convergence is normal okay. and when we say the convergence is normal we mean that it is, con it is, converge, uh, it is uniform on compact subsets of the domain. Okay. We have called the domain as D. Okay and uh, and uh, since we have taken the value infinity the convergence uh, uh, the point wise convergence is with respect to the spherical metric okay so fn of z converges to f of z in the spherical metric this is this is the same as saying that the spherical distance between fn of z and f of z that goes to zero and you want it to go to zero normally on t okay and you know the reason why we are using the spherical metric is uh, this is because f of z can take the value infinity then you will have to measure the distance of a point on the complex plane uh, to the point at infinity okay and that for that you have you have to do it only on the Riemann sphere so essentially you use a spherical metric on the Riemann sphere okay fine so uh, what we were trying to prove we were trying to prove this very important theorem that you know if uh, if you take a sequence of analytic functions suppose it converges normally to a limit function uh, then the limit function is either analytic that is holomorphic or completely it is infinity okay and you do not get anything in between all right. So, uh, how so what do we do we try to prove this by uh, using uh, by applying uh, Hurwitz's theorem and also by using the fact that the spherical metric the, the the spherical metric is uh, is invariant with respect to inversion okay we have to use these two facts and how are we going to use it uh, that's what we are trying to do so we have we have assumed that uh, the limit function is not identically infinity okay so that means that this so if you now <coughs> look at what we had written uh, in the in the last lecture the last couple of lines d infinity is the set of all z in d where f takes the value infinity that's a proper subset of d and this is this is because f is not identically infinity and uh, uh, so d infinity is a proper set and mind you d infinity is a closed subset because you see uh, I have already told you last time that uh, f has to be continuous because a uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous and a normal limit is a locally uniform limit so it is also continuous and locally continuous is the same as continuous okay because continuity is a local property. So f is certainly a continuous function and f in, in the inverse image of a closed set under a continuous map is a, is a closed set the point at infinity uh, is a closed point okay uh, the, the, the subset consisting of only a single point is closed uh, in the extended plane because the topologically is the same as uh, the uh, Riemann sphere and the infinity the point at infinity corresponds to the north pole. So, the f inverse of infinity is exactly d infinity and that is closed okay what we are trying to show is that we are trying to show d infinity is empty. Okay. We want to show we want we want to show uh, uh, d sub infinity is 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 a null set. Okay, uh, so which is the say which means that d uh, d is actually 
uh, d <coughs> so so that will mean that uh, 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 that is f is analytic uh, on d because you know uh, uh, the the fact is that uh, if you so show d infinity is uh, is empty then you are saying that at every point f takes only a finite complex value okay it doesn't take the value infinity uh, so f is not actually a map into c union infinity is actually a map into c and then uh, you know if you have a uh, uh, if you have a complex valued function which is a normal limit of analytic functions then it is analytic this is something that we have already seen this is part of uh, for example a first course in complex analysis where you essentially have to use Cauchy's theorem and you have to use Morera's theorem okay. So, uh, so all you have to show is d infinity is empty and now how do you uh, we, how do you show this we exploit the <coughs> fact that d is a connected set see d is a domain in the complex plane in the in the complex plane so d is an open connected set and of course we are always worried about only non empty sets <coughs> d is non empty and mind you uh, d uh, the, the since the d is connected uh, we use try to use this very important property of a connected space for a connected space the only subset that is both open and closed has to either be <coughs> the null set or it has to be the full space so what you try to do is that you try to show that d infinity is open okay see d infinity is already closed suppose you show d infinity is open then d infinity has to be either uh, so it is an open and closed subset of d which is connected so d infinity has to either be the null set or it has to be all of d but it is not all of d because I have assumed f is not identically infinity. So d infinity has to become the null set and you are done okay and, and the theorem is proved. So <coughs> we, <coughs> so we uh, because so let me write that down because of the connectedness uh, the connectedness <coughs> of d it is enough to show that d uh, uh, infinity is open okay uh, that is that is enough to it is enough to show that what does it mean it means that if you give me a point of d infinity then there is a whole neighborhood surrounding that point which is also in d infinity that is what openness means it means that every point is an interior point. So in other words what does it mean it means that if you take a point z0 in d infinity namely a point z0 where f takes the value infinity then there is a small neighborhood there is a small disk surrounding z0 where also f takes the value infinity that is what you have to show if f is infinity at a point then f is infinity at all points in a small disk surrounding that point this is uh, this is what will mean to say that d infinity is an open set okay so so that is what we are going to do that is exactly what we are going to do all right and for that we are going to use Kurvitz's theorem we are going to use the uh, the invariance of the spherical metric with respect to inversion okay and how we are good you will see this. So, uh, so, so start with uh, so, <coughs> so, let, so let us start with uh, uh, and, and, and is it not in d infinity okay and of course I should tell you that uh, uh, of course I am assuming d infinity is non empty okay to begin with uh, uh, if you want to be very logical uh, you can say that uh, let us assume d infinity uh, is non empty because if d infinity is in empty we are anyway done okay and so you assume d infinity is non empty and then prove uh, and get a contradiction okay. So if you want to be very logical you can say like that so in any case I am assuming uh, I start with a point uh, uh, so you know this is uh, this is often a feature of mathematics see finally d infinity is empty that is what you want to show now you want to show that the set is empty you want to show that there is no point in that set. But then you know it is roundabout the way you do it what you do is you assume it is non empty and then you try to once it is non empty you try to get some properties of the set which will give you a contradiction. So in this case you assume d infinity is non empty okay and then you get the fact that d infinity has to be everything and that is not true because f is not identically infinity okay. So this often happens in mathematics. Uh, so you start with the with the point z0 in d infinity so f of z0 is infinity this is what it is and uh, now uh, but mind you f is a continuous map okay f is a continuous map uh, into c union infinity and it is therefore it is continuous at z0 also and what I want to say is that since it is continuous at z0 okay uh, you can find a sufficiently small neighborhood of z0 such that uh, all the function values on that neighborhood okay are close to infinity 
to within whatever epsilon distance you want and mind you you have to now use the spherical metric ok. So, I am using the continuity of f at z0 ok. So, uh, since uh, f is continuous uh, the given uh, epsilon greater than 0 there exists a delta greater than 0 such that well uh, mod z minus z0 less than delta in d uh, will imply that I, sh I should write this with respect to the spherical metric d sub s f of uh, z comma f of z0 which by the way is infinity this can be made less than epsilon ok. So, you see I am uh, I have to use the spherical metric ok. So, I am just saying that since f takes the value infinity at z0 in a sufficiently small neighborhood of z0 f has to take values close to infinity. So, the distance between function values f z and infinity which is f of z0 that can be made as small as I want uh, if I choose uh, sufficiently small neighborhood delta neighborhood of z0 and of course, I have to choose it in d of course ok uh, because I want f of z to make sense because f of z is makes sense only for z in d ok. Fine. Now, you see uh, mind you what this means you see try to understand what this means it means that uh, if you take this uh, small disc centered at z0 radius delta ok then the image of that disc lies in a neighborhood of infinity because uh, the distance between f of z and f of z0 which is uh, which is equal to infinity is less than epsilon means f of z lies in a neighborhood of infinity that means that these small disc centered at z0 radius delta is mapped to the exterior of a sufficiently large circle ok. So, uh, you must think that as epsilon becomes smaller and smaller you are getting the exterior of sufficiently larger and larger circles ok. So, if you are thinking in, in uh, uh, terms of radii of circles you should think of 1 by epsilon or 1 by epsilon squared or something like that as epsilon goes to 0 because then 1 by a positive power of epsilon greater than 1 will go to infinity ok. Uh, fine. So, this is what it means. Now, you see uh, uh, so you know uh, uh, so let me tell you basically what the philosophy is all about. See the idea is very very simple uh, uh, let me give you the idea of the proof. You see f is uh, so there is this neighborhood of z0 ok at z0 f is infinity ok and then there is a small neighborhood of z0 where f is close to infinity ok. So, uh, you know if I uh, if I draw a diagram it is going to be something like this. So, let me draw a diagram it it, it, it helps to draw a diagram. So, uh, so here is z0 and there is a small disc surrounding z0 uh, radius delta and what f is doing is that it is mapping this onto uh, neighborhood of infinity which is uh, you know the exterior of a, a sufficiently large disc. this is what is happening. So, the, the interior of this ok is going to the exterior of a sufficiently large disc and so this is uh, this disc is uh, centered at z0 is radius delta sufficiently small and the image of this disc uh, I am not saying the image is a all of the uh, you know exterior of that large circle, but it is a subset of that. So, uh, uh, yeah. So this is the situation. See what this tells you, therefore, is that f is certainly bounded away from zero in a neighborhood of z0, right? Because at c, at z0, f is taking the value infinity, all right? And in a neighborhood of z0, it has to take values close to infinity. And values close to infinity are certainly non-zero values, because values close to infinity are supposed to be values which lie in the exterior of a large on the on the exterior of a large circle all right. So, f is uh, f is going to be uh, non zero in particular ok and now imagine your f n converges to f uniformly on compact subsets of d that is given to you that is given to us because we have assumed f n converges to f normally on d all right. So, because of so, so in particular you know if I choose this delta sufficiently uh, small so that even the boundary 
of that circle mod z minus z not equal to delta is also inside d I can do that if I make delta a little bit smaller if you want okay. Then uh, mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta becomes a compact set because you know it is now closed and bounded it is a compact subset of d and therefore fn will converge to f normally on that right because I uh, in fact uniformly on that because it is a compact set. So, if I choose delta sufficiently small I can make sure that on this closed small closed this centered at delta uh, centered at z not radius delta the convergence of fn to f is uniform okay but then f is never 0 there f is not 0 on that uh, on that closed disc on that small disc because it is f values are in a neighborhood of infinity so f is not 0. So that means because of uniform convergence fn's are also non zero beyond a certain stage in that in that closed disc okay and if fn's are not zero they are non zero analytic functions so 1 by fn's will become holomorphic they will become analytic okay and you know fn converges to f in the spherical metric because of the property of the uh, invariance of the spherical metric with respect to inversion fn converges to f in the spherical metric will tell you that 1 by fn converges to 1 by fn 1 by f in the spherical metric okay. So 1 by fn will converge to 1 by f and these 1 by fn's are all analytic in the disk and 1 by f therefore will become analytic in the disk but what is 1 by f of z0 it is 1 by infinity it is 0. So z0 becomes a 0 for 1 by f okay and 1 by fn is a sequence of analytic functions that is converging normally to 1 by f in the disk apply Hurwitz's theorem what it will tell you is that all the 1 by fn's beyond a certain stage they will have zeros as many zeros with multiplicities as the 0 z0 of 1 by f okay. But then you see if 1 by fn has zeros that means fn will have poles all right but fn are all analytic how can they have poles that is a contradiction therefore the uh, the moral of the story is that you get a contradiction okay and therefore uh, so you can see you can either see this as a contradiction or you can go one step further and say that see uh, 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 the uh, uh, where you can you can look at where Hurwitz's theorem will go wrong see Hurwitz's theorem can go wrong in the following sense if uh, you take a sequence of analytic functions if they are converging normally to a limit function okay then Hurwitz's theorem says that uh, 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 a 0 of the limit function comes from the zeros of the functions which converge to that limit okay it comes as a limit point of zeros of functions that converge to that limit function. But then there is one extreme possibility the limit function itself could have been identically 0 okay if the limit function is identically 0 okay then that then that is a case which we do not deal with in the actual Hurwitz theorem. See in the, in the Hurwitz theorem we always assume that you have an isolated 0 of the limit function. So the only way this Hurwitz theorem can fail to uh, apply here is that 1 by f becomes identically 0. But then if you think if you say that 1 by f becomes identically 0 you are just saying that f is identically infinity in a neighborhood of z0 and that means that uh, wherever f is infinity if you take a point where f is infinity then there is a neighborhood surrounding the point where again f is infinity. So d infinity is open and we are done okay so the, there are both so there are these ways of looking at it which will give you the proof of the theorem okay. So now, le now let me uh, uh, write down things in words okay uh, so, so let me write this. Uh, uh, we can we can choose uh, delta small enough so that mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta is in d okay uh, and now you see you also have this uniform convergence uh, since uh, uh, fn of uh, fn converges to f uniformly uh, I should say uh, normally oops normally uh, 
uh, fn converges to f uniformly i'm i'm abbreviating uniformly to uflly on on uh, mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta okay and uh, well um, uh, note that uh, uh, so so what does this mean this means that if for the spherical metric if you take fn of z and f of z this see this distance can be made lesser uh, i mean this this distance goes to zero uniformly on mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta because of course mod minus z z mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta is compact okay and what does uniform convergence means uniform convergence means that you can choose an index uh, capital n large enough such that for all small n greater than capital n uh, you know uh, you can make this spherical distance lesser than epsilon if you want okay so mind you we have already started with some epsilon okay let's keep that epsilon so uh, there exists an n sufficiently large so that uh, n uh, greater than or uh, n n greater than or equal to cap small n greater than or equal to capital n greater than or equal to capital n uh, uh, implies that the distance spherical distance between f n of z and f of z can be made less than epsilon but here is the uniform here is the uniformity of the convergence uh, for all z in mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta uh, independent of n see the point is that you can choose this capital n in a way that has got nothing to do with this z that is the uniformity of the convergence okay in general if it is point wise convergence for the capital n will depend on epsilon of course but it will also depend on the z the particular z you are looking at the point z but the uniform convergence is that now you have this capital n depending only on epsilon and not depending on z z could have been anything so let us look at this d sub s of i am trying to compare f n of z uh, and f of z naught which is infinity and this is by triangle inequality it is d sub s f n of z and now you put f of z okay and then put d sub s f of z and f of z not this i can do put fz okay you introduce this fz as a third point in the triangle to apply the triangle inequality okay now if you do this see this is this is certainly less than see the ds fnz fz that is less than epsilon as i have under, underlined above so i'll get an epsilon plus the ds fz fz not is also less than epsilon that's because of continuity of f at z not so i'll get epsilon plus plus epsilon just two epsilon okay so what this will tell you is that uh, this will tell you what we want uh, and and you know, and you know this is for this is for n greater than or equal to capital n so what this will tell you is that beyond a certain stage all the fn's they are in neighborhood of infinity so they don't vanish and that is what i want i want all the fn's not to vanish beyond a certain stage why because then i can invert them and say that they they they, they will the inverses will also be analytic okay so thus so this is what i want thus uh, fn uh, uh, for n greater than or equal to small n greater than or equal to capital n uh, do not vanish uh, on mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta and hence 1 by fn uh, n greater than or equal to capital n are analytic there analytic or holomorphic there I wanted to invert the fn's and why I wanted to infer, invert the fn's because you see uh, uh, I want to use this uh, you know the invariance of the spherical metric with respect to inversion. So now d s of f of uh, 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 fn of z comma f of z this is the same as d s of 1 by fn of z comma 1 by f of z 
you have this ok. Here is where I am using the invariance of the spherical metric with respect to inversion and mind you what is it that we have what is our basic assumption our basic assumption is that this fellow on the left goes to 0 un, uh, uh, normally on D ok. This is our assumption original assumption but that quantity is equal to the quantity on the right side ok and you see but there is a small thing uh, this is z, this is this the, the quantity on the left side goes to 0 uniform uh, normally on D it goes to 0 uniformly on mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta because it is a compact subset of D ok. So, uniformly on mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta that let me write that. But see this equality that I have written that is valid everywhere but the only problem is you know uh, 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 I want see I want 1 by f n to be analytic ok and that does not happen everywhere that happens anyway or anyway on mod z minus z naught as an equal to delta. So, see I am worried about the equality only in mod z minus z naught as an equal to delta because the 1 by f n's are analytic there for small n greater than or equal to capital N ok 1 by f n converges to 1 by f ok and these uh, in see this is uniformly in mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta all right this is uniform convergence and the 1 by f n's these 1 by f n's are all analytic they are all analytic in mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta ok. So, you have sequence of analytic functions that is converging to a limit function ok and this is this convergence is not is actually uniform convergence and mind you the limit function is also complex value that is the big deal. See notice f is uh, f f f takes values in a neighborhood of infinity right f at z naught is infinity and in that small disk surrounding z naught f takes values in a neighborhood of infinity that is the reason why why the dist spherical distance between f of z and f of z naught which is infinity is less than epsilon that is what it means. So, f takes values also in a neighborhood of infinity there and if f takes values in a neighborhood of infinity f is not 0 of course ok and 1 by f will become very small because f is very large. So, 1 by f is bounded. So, the moral of the story is that this is a uh, 1 by f is a not in in that neighborhood mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta 1 by f is a complex valued function that is it is a bounded complex valued function that is the big deal there ok. It does not take the value infinity 1 by f never takes the value infinity ok because f is f takes values in a neighborhood of infinity ok. So, uh, so 1 by f this is bounded uh, uh, in mod z minus z naught less than equal to delta ok. Now, you know now we are again using this standard theorem from a first course in complex analysis that you are normal limit of analytic functions if the limit function is also a complex valued function then the limit function is continuous and in fact it is analytic. So, the moral of the story is see all this pain is to say that 1 by f makes sense and 1 by f is uh, a complex value. Of course, 1 by f 1 by f z naught is going to be 0 because 1 by f z naught is 1 by infinity which is 0 according to our conventions all right. So, this 1 by f is in a neighborhood of 0 actually it takes values in a neighborhood of 0 because f takes values in a neighborhood of infinity ok. So, so, so let me write that here takes values in a neighborhood of 0 which is actually 1 by f z naught. Okay. Now, what does all this tell you? This all these things will now tell you that 1 by f is analytic at uh, z naught. Okay, and of course, one and in at z naught, what happens? At one at z naught, 1 by f is zero because it's infinity. Uh, f of z is infinite. F of z naught is infinity. Therefore, z naught becomes a zero of an analytic function. And what is the property of a zero of an analytic function? It is uh, isolated. 
so the moral of the story is that 1 by f is analytic at z0, z0 is a 0 of 1 by f, now appeal to Hurwitz's theorem, now appeal to Hurwitz's theorem and uh, what will Hurwitz's theorem say? Hurwitz's theorem will say that if 1 by f is not identically 0, then z0 will be an isolated 0 for 1 by f and suppose it has a certain order L, then all the fn's, all the 1 by fn's for n sufficiently large will also have z L zeros in a neighborhood of z0. But zeros of 1 by fn are the same as poles of fn and that is not allowed because fn's are all analytic, how can they have poles? So, you, you, are, you cannot apply Hurwitz's theorem, you should not be able to apply Hurwitz's theorem. The only way out is that 1 by f should be identically 0 in that neighborhood and 1 by f being identically 0 in that neighborhood is the same as f being identically infinity in that neighborhood and that is all we want. Okay. So, you see here is where Hurwitz's theorem comes in. All right. So, let me write that down. Uh, mm, uh, so, let me write this here uh, by Hurwitz's theorem. Either uh, 1 by f is identically 0 in mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta, uh, which means uh, so I should say, yeah, which means f is identically infinity in mod z minus z naught less than delta, all right, uh, or uh, 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 d z naught is an isolated of 1 by f uh, say of order L and for n sufficiently large uh, 1 by f n also have L zeros in mod z minus z not less than delta which is impossible, which is impossible as f n will then have L poles in mod z minus z not less than less than delta for n sufficiently large. Okay. So, what this tells you is that the only way out uh, so, f is identically infinity that is the only way out for uh, mod z minus z naught less than delta okay. uh, and this means that mod z minus z naught less than delta uh, is contained in uh, d infinity. So, you start with the you start with the z naught uh, uh, in d infinity I am able to find a whole disk surrounding z naught which is also in d infinity. So, d infinity is open ok. So, d infinity is open, uh, but already we know d infinity is closed. So, d infinity is both an open and closed subset of uh, it is both open and closed subset of uh, d which is connected. So, there is no other choice it has to either be d or empty, but it, it is not d because f is not identically infinity. So, it has to be m just the empty set and we are done ok. Uh, thus uh, uh, d infinity is both open and closed in d which is connected. should remove the comma here. So, d infinity is not the null set or d, but f not identically infinity implies that d infinity is not d. So, d infinity is the null set and this means f is analytic on d and, uh, and that, that finishes the proof. So, this is a this is a very very nice theorem ok. 
So, if a sequence of holomorphic functions on a domain converges in the spherical metric normally then the limit function is either holomorphic that is analytic or you go to the other extreme the limit function is identically infinite you do not get something in between and the idea is what could you get in between uh, well if you want something mild you, you can have a meromorphic function which means that you get some points uh, which are isolated where the limit function develops poles okay but what this theorem says is that it simply cannot develop a pole somewhere okay and you know now the reason philosophically why why f cannot develop a pole at a point because you see if f n converges to f in the spherical metric and f develops a pole up at a point then because of the invariance of the spherical metric with respect to inversion 1 by f n will converge to 1 by f okay but then 1 by f n uh, will converge to 1 by f and if f has a pole at a point 1 by f will have a 0 there. So, the 1 by f n's will uh, start uh, having zeros by Hurwitz's theorem and they, they will give rise to poles of f n which is not possible okay. Of course, there is a much worse thing that you can expect that uh, uh, the this uh, uh, f n converges to f f of course, you know this f if you look at the locus where f is not infinity that is of course, an open set because that is a complement of d infinity and on that open set f is going to be analytic there is no problem it is a honest complex valued function which is a uniform limit of analytic function. So, it is analytic there is no problem but what kind of a set d infinity is is, is very very uh, you know uh, it is very mysterious what could have happened is that this d what is what what prevents d infinity from being uh, uh, set with non empty in interior okay why should be an isolated set of points if d infinity is an isolated set of points it means that f is a meromorphic function but why should it be an isolated set of points it why why can't d infinity be a curve okay if it is a curve then d infinity the, then it means that your f has non isolated singularities okay why should why should d infinity you know if you want f to be meromorphic the condition is that uh, d infinity must be an isolated set of points. So, the next theorem that we are, we are going to prove in the next uh, lecture is that if you drop the assumption that the f n's are holomorphic assume that they are meromorphic then also the limit function f will be meromorphic it would not be any worse that is d infinity will only be a set of isolated points and it cannot be it cannot contain non isolated points. So, you cannot have a sequence of a, a, a sequence of meromorphic function if it goes to a limit function then that limit function you know it cannot have horrible non isolated singularities it can have only isolated singularities and they have to only be poles okay this is again a very good thing and we will prove this in the next lecture.